Well, friends, um, as we get into our message today, let me say that uh, last Wednesday we had our Ash Wednesday service, and it was really beautiful as it was a collaboration between the light that is our daughter congregation over in the Rock Springs area behind Clark Central High School, and uh, they came over, and and then together we uh, we offered this up to God, this Ash Wednesday service. It was really, really moving. I heard many positive comments about that, but that was the beginning of the Easter season that we call Lent. So Lent is a 40-day period between Ash Wednesday and Easter, not including the Sundays. So this is the time where in Lent what we're doing is we're marching toward the cross and the resurrection on the other side of the cross. And so this is the time when really God calls you and me as Christians to to learn from Him, to listen to Him, and to really take Romans 12, 1 to heart, which says that in view of God's mercy that we are to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. So God is going to be teaching us how to do that um, over the coming Sundays. And so each Sunday I'm going to be preaching uh, a message. It will be basically based on a book called Altered. So this will be our Lenten series for the next few weeks. Altered is a, is a great book that's written by a teacher out of Houston, Texas. And so I'm going to be using this as a framework for the messages, kind of like using some of the ideas, but then filling it in with a lot of uh, just scripture study that I do through the week, um, thoughts that the Lord downloads in prayer. And, uh, and so it should be really, really fun as we go through this together. But the prevailing idea that you're going to be hearing is is that as we lay ourselves down on the altar we are altered by the power of God where God is changing us changing us as a church and making us look more and more like Jesus which by the way is the goal of your life that's what, that's what God paints, is that he wants to see his son alive in you. Because as that happens, guess what? We're going to be out there, not so much stuck on self, but thinking about all the people out there in our communities. So like, just as a small example, we can help children in Clark County get off the floor and into the bed. Like through sleep in heavenly peace. That's just one example where we can be in ministry to others. And our youth band is in ministry to us today. I got to tell you, y'all did such a great job. I mean, Jack, um, just to see you up there uh, leading in worship as you were during one of the songs. And when you were singing, you were singing with such passion. It was coming from your heart. And that helps us. Um, and when you all do it as well, it helps us to worship God well. Yeah, so thank you. Yeah, because you're, you're being a living example of that, and uh, we appreciate it. All right, friends. Well, looking at the scriptures, um, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis 8. And look at, tell you what, turn to verse 20, and let me give you a little bit of background here. Um, it's easy to miss if you don't read the scriptures closely. But did you realize, did you know that Noah was on the ark from the time that it was built and then he got all the animals loaded up and then God shut the door supernaturally and then the rain started coming down. From the time he got on that ark and was shut in, he was in the ark for over a year before he ever came out and got on dry land. A year. Now, think about your own life. Okay, we're going to approach it this way to help you understand just the impact of that and how difficult that had to be. Raise your hand if you have animals. Okay, a lot of you do. Okay, Um, yeah, we do too as well. Um, At one time, we had a dog and two cats. Uh, We've got two cats now. Our dog, Rex, has had a home going. He's in heaven up there, okay, running around there chasing squirrels, I'm sure. But um, Rex, when he was alive with us, he lived for 10 years. Rex was a short hair boxer, um, 
he was a mixture of really just a whole lot of Chinese Sharpe um, and then other stuff. He was really a conglomeration of all kinds of dogs. So, but he was a great dog. And, um, but the thing about Rex is, as a short-haired dog was, was that he shed all the time. I mean, there was black fur constantly in the house. Sherry was amazed at how much would gather. She had pointed out to me, and I was oblivious to it somehow, but she would just say, look at all this, look at all this hair the dog is shedding here. And he really would. He'd just shed, especially in the summertime. So it was a mess to clean up. We've got two cats that are in our house as well. Um, with cats that spend the night indoors in the wintertime at least, when it gets below freezing, uh, they will spend the night in our laundry room and we'll have a litter box there. So the litter box has to be cleaned out. With cats, it's not easy because it's just not an enjoyable smell, you know, when you're going to clean out the litter boxes. Um, so you think about animals, and here's, what it, here's the deal about animals. We love animals, right? But animals cause issues sometimes, right? With cleanups, with taking them to the vet, with money. They, I mean, there's animals and issues. They go hand in hand. Think about Noah. He's got hippopotamuses and giraffes and, and ostriches and lions. I mean, just think about I mean, the smell of having all those animals in one place. I know what it smells like with our cats, with the litter box. Not, not very inviting. Think about the noise of all those animals. Imagine Noah being woken up at 3 o'clock in the morning and he's thinking, is there a construction crew at work on the ark? And, and his wife said, no, that's just the, the woodpeckers. Brrr, you know, just, just hammering at all times, night and day. Think about the food you'd have to supply all those animals. I mean, my goodness. Um, how about like with the beavers? Beavers are hungry. They just ate that redwood tree. Time to drag an oak tree in there and let them start gnawing on it. You know, so it would have been a lot of work for Noah. He was probably so elated when his feet hit earth again, he could say, I'm free. Free at last. Thank the Lord I'm free at last. Well, when Noah got off the ark, put yourself in his place. What would you have done if you'd have been, uh, been Noah? What was the first thing you'd have done? Now, for me, I'd, I'd have been thinking, okay, you know what? I've been working for an entire year. I need a long fishing trip. Okay. Or to go skiing somewhere or whatever. What would you have done? Well, you know what Noah did? First thing after he got all the animals and he got his family off the ark. Verse 20 says here from Genesis, it says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. First thing the man did. Now that's pretty remarkable because even in a practical way, you might think to yourself if you're Noah, okay, wait a second, I've got to build a home now. This ark can't be my home because it's not near a spring. It's not near a river of running water. Because remember, the ark was up on a mountain. So he had to go and find a place where he could get drinkable water. So he would have think, been thinking, okay, I've got to build a home and I've got to find a good uh, running water that will be safe for us to drink. So just on a practical way, he may have been thinking, Mike, you are known to build a house and you're working on your house right now but um, he would have been thinking i got to build a house now but no first thing he did was build that altar do you know what Noah was showing us was that God was his first priority first we can learn a lot from that um you're doing great today because you chose to make God your first priority this morning. Coming to church, going to Sunday school, offering yourselves, youth band, to the Lord to lead us in worship. Y'all made God the number one priori priority this morning. How's God, God going to be your number one priority on Thursday night? How about Saturday morning? How about Tuesday at lunch? How do you and I keep God the 
priority, the top priority for the rest of our lives and maybe even beyond. There's a guy I know, and I was just so amazed by this example. He takes very seriously the command of Jesus where Jesus teaches us, seek first my Father's kingdom and his righteousness. Because what Jesus is pointing us to is top priority, right? Putting him, number one. Well, I know a guy who, um, who did this in his life, but he also did it in a real good way after his death because what he got an attorney to do was to write into his will. He said, listen, he said, upon my death, he goes with my estate, I want the first 10% to go to God. And then the 90% to go to my kids. So even when his body was in the grave and his spirit's in heaven, it was a way of saying, God, even beyond the grave, I choose you as my number one. I keep you as my top priority. So even in death, my friend was making God his champion. Look at the scripture. Then Noah built an altar. He built an altar to the Lord. Let's talk about altars a little bit. There are altars that you can make in your life in very, very easy, but also creative and innovative ways if you just put your mind to it. it sometimes it doesn't take a lot of effort. But altars are the place where you and I can connect with God. Now, with Noah, notice this. Noah did this. He came out, he built this altar. He sacrificed some animals on it. And then in verse 21, it says, The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma. It was a sacrifice that Noah had made. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the Lord saw that sacrifice. He was pleased by it. And it just made him, it thrilled God. And then later on, God blessed Noah and also spoke to Noah. All right? So altars are the place where you encounter God, where you experience the presence of God. Noah built that altar, God showed up. God revealed himself to Noah in a special way. So when you do that, Jesus is there, and he'll make you aware of it as well. So no, altars are the space where you interact with the Lord. All right? Altars also um, are, are things that you and I will create, but we do need to understand at times they take effort to do it. Think about Noah. Noah got off the ark, and what would he have done to build an altar? Well, he'd have gone to look for, first of all, some rocks. He'd have gotten some mud and kind of put it together. So it would have taken effort for he and his sons to gather up all the materials to construct it and then get it to be ready for a place where he'd then stack the wood and then put the slaughtered animals on top of that. So it took effort. My cousin, who lives up in Cleveland, Georgia, he told me, he said, he didn't do this, it wasn't too long ago, he built, um, he built a prayer room in his house in the basement where one did not exist. So he kind of uh, figured it out in his mind. He took some two-by-fours, framed it, the, the wall or the, uh, the room in, put the sheetrock on, put the carpet down, did all the kind of stuff, and that became his prayer room. And so he utilizes that. That's where my cousin Chris finds the Lord. He even built like a, an altar rail like we have here um, where he will kneel down. He'll have his Bible on top of it. It's a place where he finds Jesus. But it took effort to do it. So just understand that. That is going to be a part, a component of creating altars in your life. It's going to take effort. Altars are the place also where you and I make sacrifices to God. And it's, fortunately, we live in New Testament times. We don't have to go and get a bull and, and you know, take care of it, take it out of this world and then put it up on an altar. It's so less messy for you and I to make a sacrifice. And by the way, the best sacrifice you'll ever give Jesus is to do like Romans 12, 1. Offer yourself as a living sacrifice. 
That's what he's looking for. But let me tell you about just the sacrifice. You can do it in the largest of ways. You can even do it in the smallest of ways, and God will be pleased. So last Tuesday, I'd had a long day. I mean, I was just run over by activity all day long. I, had, I did not have like a block of time like I normally do, where I will try to allocate like an hour to the Lord where I can just um, encounter him in one of these rooms or maybe even the sanctuary through a regular work day. Um, so I was a little frustrated by the end of the day, and I was just feeling tense. And, and I said, Holy Spirit, it's evening time, it's nightfall. Would you help me? Would you please help me? Because I just want to, I want to give myself, I want to be with you tonight. And so I came home, nobody was in the house, Stephanie was at UGA, Sherry was shopping, it was around 6 o'clock at night. I made my dinner, and you know what I did? I, I, let, the, um, I let the dinner table kind of become my altar. Because I set the food down, and normally, instead of bringing this out and, and checking some scores, seeing how uh, one of my favorite college teams is doing in recruiting um, or anything else, um, I just push it aside, and I said, Jesus, I said, now is, this is your time. And so what I did was, in order to really kind of connect with the Lord, is, I mean, this is going to sound a little funny, but, but it works. I just looked at what I had on my plate, and, and I was like, Lord, thank you for this broccoli that I'm eating now. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't have to grow it in a garden. I didn't have to bring it to Publix. I didn't have to get it from Publix. It was brought to me. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> and, and I didn't have to cook it either. Thank you again, Sherry. And, and so, uh, but I put it on the plate, and it's just like, thank you, God. Thank you that it tastes good. Thank you for all the things that I eat, God, that you constantly give me that I don't even bother to thank you for. I'm grateful, God, for what you do. And y'all, I felt the presence of God because I turned everything off and I just dialed into the Lord. Later on, I went to Planet Fitness. And I went over there to get some exercise in. So I'm on the elliptical machine. And on the elliptical machine, I've got a lot of distractions. Because I've got the Weather Channel. I've got ESPN. I've got Fox News. I've got all these things that I really enjoy. You know, kind of just catching up on the day's events. And seeing some of the monster dunks from the night before. That somebody may throw into the basket. And, uh, but but I, I just said, no, Holy Spirit. I'm not going to look at that. And would you help me to just pray to Jesus. And for the next 30 minutes, that elliptical machine became my altar because that's where I encountered God because I, I tuned out the distractions and, and I was just praying. And I was praying and the presence of God was there. You can make an altar anywhere you go. You just have to take the effort and you have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you so that you, in, you encounter God in that spot, just like Noah did. There's no difference, all right? So, but what you're going to have to do is, sometimes, a lot of times, you're going to have to sacrifice your leisure time for worship time. It involves taking something that we want to do, like I wanted to look at ESPN. I'm telling you, I wanted to see the Weather Channel, because I like to find out what the weather's going to be for the next day. I wanted to watch that. But I had to trade that for what I needed to do. I needed God at that moment. Later on, I was able to get to the other stuff. But I needed the Lord. And, and so I had to sacrifice that time. Did you know that Ephesians 5.2 says this? That Jesus gave himself up as a fragrant sacrifice to the Father? See, Jesus was a walking sacrifice. He shows us how to do it well in this world. And again, Romans 12, 1 says, Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. So your life, you are to be a sacrifice on two feet. As you're walking through every space at life. Friends, do you understand? Your life is not defined by how many children you have by how 
great your grandkids are, though I'm sure they're awesome. And maybe they're all honor students at Malcolm Bridge Elementary. Your, your life doesn't consist of that. God decorates your life with it. Those things are important. Your life isn't defined by what you achieve or what you acquire in this life. Scott, it's not defined by how many sales you get over at Wander Ford. You know, when you bust the sales record. Your, your life is defined by your relationship with God. And in relationship, sacrifice is never an option. It's a requirement. In all that we do, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Did you notice that the scripture didn't say, for a one time, for a moment in time, sacrifice? (laughs) No, it, it said living, which means at all times, right? Now, sacrifices, when you lay something on the altar of God's presence, If it's your time, if it's your money, if it's your service to God, like the youth group is doing today, whatever it may be, Romans 12, 1 says, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. The next word is holy. Now this is really exciting to me, because you've heard me say it before. If you earned $50 this past week, and you put a $5 bill in this offering basket right here, The moment that you set it in the basket and you said, God, this is yours, at that very moment, it became holy. God touched it and God blessed it. As Leviticus, I'm going to check this, I think it's Leviticus 27, 28. When I get to my notes, I'll tell you if I was wrong or not and I'll correct that. But I think that's right because that's what it's kind of getting at is that when we surrender something to the Lord... He, he then makes it holy at that point from there on out because it's dedicated. It is Leviticus 27, 28. You know, it's nice to be right for at least once a year. So I, I guess I've met my quota for 2024. Okay. Um, but let me tell you what holy looks like in your life. It can happen in very practical ways, as long as your heart is in it, God will take it. He will take what's unholy and make it holy. Okay? Um, Nine days ago, not this past Friday, Friday before that, I was over in Norcross. I was over there because, um, as I've shared with you before, I'm a connecting elder in the North Georgia region, um, over seven counties, and, and there's about 11 connecting elders over the map of North Georgia. And so we are being trained by the bishop. There's two bishops in the world, and one of them flew in. He came out of Houston, Texas with his wife. So he was training us on Friday afternoon. And this bishop had already had a long day because he had had to hop on a plane out of Houston, get to Atlanta, then get to his hotel, check in, and then get over to Norcross GMC where he was training us. Afterwards, we went out to dinner And then at that point, um, something, he was given a choice to do something. Now, let me preface this by saying the bishop is, I think he's already started. I think he started it last Monday. He was going to be, this was Friday. The next day on Saturday, he was going to be leading a conference of about a thousand people, which some of you all were at down in Norcross, the first GMC gathering. It was was amazing, it was awesome. Um, So he had to lead that. And then he's going to be preaching the next day. And then I think after that, he's going to be hopping on a plane, getting back to Houston. And then he and his wife are going to be leaving their house behind for 47 days. As they go all across the globe, and it's not a vacation, it's, a, it's really a workcation where they are out in the Philippines, they're going to Africa, they're going to Europe, they're going to all these places where they are building the churches up in faith, leading all these conferences because the Holy Spirit is moving across the globe. So he and his wife have given themselves to God during Lent. In fact, his wife jokingly said, well, uh, Scott, I guess we're giving our house up for Lent because they wouldn't see it for 47 days now 
about to embark on that journey when he's with us in Atlanta, what does that man do on Friday night? Well, it's around 8 o'clock after we've eaten dinner, and I would have been thinking like, man, this guy needs to get a nap, right? And go back to his hotel. But somebody in the group said, Bishop, there is a, um, there's a pastor in North Georgia. He has been faithfully serving our churches for the past 11 years. He's been a local licensed pastor. Ken, you know what that means. It means that he's basically been bivocational, having a job through the day, like working at Sears or something, and then serving God with the rest of the time, preaching on Sundays, visiting the sick in hospitals after work or before work, doing all these kind of things for 11 years. And they said, uh, Bishop, he's done everything that he needs to do to be ordained, and that's what he was on track for. But then he, he got this sickness, and he's going to die from it. And he's in bed, and we don't think he's going to last until, you know, probably April. And uh, they said, Bishop, what do you think we ought to do about this? And the bishop said, let's go see him. Now, this is Friday night. He's in Norcross. The bishop is. About to leave for 47 days. He gets in a car. He drives the hour up to Gainesville to see a dying sick man right there. The bishop's on the right. Um, the pastor's wife is on the left. He goes up there. You see that red stole that's around his neck? That's what clergy wear. So he put that around his neck, and he anointed him, and then he consecrated him as an ordained pastor. That man is the first person to be ordained in all of North Georgia into the global Methodist church. Right there! That shows you the heart. And y'all, when the bishop did that, see... He, the man was tired. He'd had a long day. He's about to give up his home for 47 days. But what does he do? He lays himself down on the altar of Jesus and says, Jesus, if you're calling me to Gainesville, I'll go. And he went. And he gave himself. That's what living a holy life looks like. You spend your life for the sake of others so that other people can gain so the other people can be blessed and encounter God. And in that space right there, it became holy ground. That man will never preach a sermon. He'll never go visit anybody in the hospital. He'll be visited. He'll never be able to baptize a person who's just gotten saved. But the bishop did that as a way to honor his life and mark him for God. Yeah, a holy offering to the Lord. Friends, when you make sacrifices, any kind, even like going to Gainesville late on a Friday night when you're tired, when you make sacrifices from your heart, God sees and God is pleased. Because that's what Genesis 8.21 said that when Noah offered those animals right there into the fire, God smelled it. He smelled the pleasing aroma. Now by the way, this was a sacrifice that Noah made. Do you know how I know that? It's because he only had two of everything. And there was a limited supply of food. When he got off the ark, he needed those animals, the edible ones at least, he needed them to be able to eat, I mean, just in order to live. So he was sacrificing his food supply and living on a farm as I had before, I know that the animals may be here today, but it's no guarantee they're going to live until tomorrow because they could get a virus just like happened to my dad's cattle herd and wiped them out. 
all of them. And when a virus hits an animal population like that, they're not fit to eat. So Noah made a real sacrifice. God calls you and I to continually be that sacrifice. Do you know how you offer a sacrifice to God? Do you know how, how can you determine when a sacrifice is a sacrifice? When what you give is a sacrifice? You'll know it when it costs you something. If it costs you, then it's legit. It counts. All right? And, and the nice thing is, look what happens when you, and we're about to close with this, and we'll have a song, and we'll go eat some lunch at a baby sprinkle. Yeah, I, I've been wondering, you know, what in the world is a baby sprinkle? I found out, okay, showers are for the first baby, baby sprinkles are a little less intensive, they're for the second baby, okay? Now you know, all right? <laughs> but I'm looking forward, Gabriel, to this baby sprinkle that we're going to be having. Um, so when Noah made the sacrifice to God and God was pleased, what did God do? You need to understand this because this is what happens. There's going to be a response from Jesus when you make a sacrifice of something to him. Guess what? The scripture says, first of all, God was pleased, right? He was pleased. And then God made a promise to Noah. And then look at verse 9-1. It said that God blessed Noah and his sons, and then God had a conversation with Noah. So here's what you need to understand, is that when you give something to Jesus that costs you something, you dedicate it to him, at that moment it becomes holy, because you've made him your top priority in your life, and you keep him in that position where he alone belongs as sovereign. God will plant a blessing on you and sometimes he'll allow that blessing that he marks you with to splash on the people around you. Noah made the sacrifice his sons didn't. But God saw the sacrifice, he was pleased and God decided, you know what? I'm not only going to bless Noah because of this, I'm going to bless his sons too. His family, the people that matter to Noah. So just think about that. Next time you sacrifice something for Jesus' sake, he may, put, he may splash that blessing onto your children and onto your grandchildren and, and onto your friends, family, anybody else. Here's the last point. When you make sacrifices to God, what you give to God will always be less than what God gives back to you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's kids said, Amen. Amen.